You are listening to Hit Play, Not Pause, a feisty menopause podcast for active, performance-minded women. I am your host, Celine Yeager. Each week, I bring you advice from athletes, scientists, researchers, and other experts to help you feel and perform your best, no matter what your hormones are doing. This show is a production of Live Feisty Media. Hello, strong, feisty women. So I just got back from the USA Triathlon's Endurance Exchange Conference in Austin, Texas, where I had the privilege to speak on coaching and training during menopause, which let's just say it's a really nice step forward that there was a session on menopause at a USAT event like this. The talk was also really well received, and I'm just really happy to see the openness and the progress being made in this area. And I'd like to thank everybody who came up to me during the event and shared kind words about the show and about the presentation itself. I really appreciate it, and I left with a heart that's a little fuller and a little bigger. So thank you so much. Okay, speaking of big, full hearts... This week's guest definitely has a big, full heart, as well as a big, beautiful mind full of wisdom to share. I had the privilege to sit down with two-time Olympian, bronze medalist sprinter, model, and business owner, Jennifer Stout, who you also may remember played Rebel the Gladiator on the hit show Gladiators. For those who don't remember, The Gladiators was a massively popular show in the 90s with about over 14 million viewers at its peak. It was essentially a game show where athletic contestants would battle as contenders against the cast gladiators to earn points in like an array of events that tested speed and strength and stamina and skill. There was jousting, battles on suspension bridges, battles on climbing walls, swinging pendulums, the works. We talk all about all of that journey, including some of her more recent struggles through menopause and hormone therapy, which I originally heard her talk about on Black Menopause and Beyond with Anita Powell. And speaking of Black menopause, we dive into that too. As I wrote about for this week's blog, which comes out tomorrow, Black women have a rougher time than white women and many other races and ethnicities during menopause. And on average, they start menopause earlier and suffer symptoms like hot flashes longer, all while getting less care. So Jennifer shared her thoughts on all of that as well. Okay, before we get to it, I invite you to follow us at Feisty Menopause at Instagram and Facebook. You can also join our private Hit Play Not Pause Facebook group where we are now over 20,000 women in there sharing uh, their stories and helping each other out. Please sign up for my weekly blog where I share the latest research and what it means for you. You can sign up for that at feistymenopause.com. Thanks as always for the continued ratings and five-star reviews. It means a lot to me and it helps the show continue to grow and to bring in great guests like Jenny Stout. And uh, quickly, I'd like to thank NutriSense for their continued support in the new year. Wearing a CGM helped me really understand that carbs are not the enemy that many continue to make them out to be and helped me improve my glucose and how I feel and perform by being sure to eat more carbohydrates. So thank you, NutriSense, for your continued support. All right, enough of me. Let's have a few quick words about our awesome sponsors and get on with the show. Okay, Jenny, I am over the moon to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. You have had um, such a rich, like amazing life's journey. And I I would love to start maybe a bit at the beginning because I know you were a world-class sprinter in the, you know, the 80s and 90s. How did you discover that talent? Like how did, you know, you ended up at the Olympics and you got a bronze in the relay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, I, I started, I, um, you know, as a kid, I was never good. I mean, as a junior, I was absolutely rubbish. I succumbed last in all of my sort of like um, English school games. Yeah, and it was a, I think it was my PE teacher, Carol, I can't remember her surname, but she, she got me into running. She just said, look, you know, this is, this is something that you're going to be really good at. But because I wasn't the most talented person, I had to work hard. There was a young girl that I saw who went to our, my English schools and she made the 1984 Olympic Games. Her name was called Simone Jacobs. And I remember, I remember watching her thinking, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be so good to go to the Olympic Games? And I thought, okay, so th- this was 84 and I thought, 
you know, I've got 1988, let's try it. But surprisingly, the coach that I had at the time had no faith in me, didn't think I could do it. So I had to go looking for somebody who would allow me and believed in the dream that I had. So I just put my head down and worked really hard for four years. Went to the first Olympic Games in 1988 with Flo Jo and Ben Johnson and all those cats. Damn. Yeah, it was, a, it was a whole new ball game watching these guys like compete and doing their thing. And, um, and then from that, um, that first experience at the Olympic Games in Seoul, I was like, I'd like to go as an individual and definitely get a medal. So I knew the next time I was going to be 27 because I started quite late. Um, got my head down again, did exactly the same thing and um, ended up getting a bronze medal in four by four. So I was, yeah, really, really, really happy. But more to the point about how I set my goals and I went for them. Did I assume you found that coach that, that did believe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I went through a number of coaches and, it, you know, the one thing that I found is very difficult for people to believe in the dream that you want to believe in, you know, that sort of thing. And I found it, um, you know, I found two coaches that were really on my side for the time that I was doing athletics um, and really pushed me forward. But um, yeah, it was difficult. It wasn't, it wasn't the easiest run because, um, um, you know, the people that I associated myself with, they were better than I was. So I was kind of like playing the catch up game. I was like standing behind like the, like the little shadow um, and just trying to push myself forward. Wow, that's it's very cool. It's very cool when dreams come true like that. But yeah, you, 100%. I, I read that um, that was sort of the sprinting career was a, a bit halted in 93 by an injury. Yeah. What, what happened? Yeah, yeah. So I had a really bad um, hamstring tear and um, I just couldn't recover. It took me maybe three three years or so to, to try and recover from this hamstring. Because, I, you know, like I said, I was just a very, very hard worker. I worked for a full-time job. So having, um, trying to do the physiotherapy and the massage, I'd single, my, you know, my mom was a single parent. So a lot of the time the aftercare was very, very minimal. So, yeah. you know, my injury problems were always going to be heightened more than everyone else because I didn't have the funds to pay for things. So when my hamstring didn't get better, um, a friend of mine um, introduced me to the gladiators. I was going to ask how that... Uh... <laughs> So you got introduced to the gladiators to help your no no see see I got in, I got introduced to it because somebody said to me Jennifer you'd be such a great um, gladiator and I was like no I'm a serious athlete I don't jump around in lycra there's no way I'm not doing it so they were like just go for it you know just see how it goes you know you, you don't know how long your athletic career is going to be for and to be fair. I mean, now everyone's running to their 30s, but at that time, everyone was stopping in, you know, late 20s. So, yeah. so I kind of looked at it and thought, okay, you know, maybe I haven't got that long. This would be a great crossover to do something else. Um, and that's when I went and did the tryouts. And I um, had to climb a rope. I had to be physical. I went from running in a lane <laughs> on my own, in my own prowess and my own, you know, understanding of my, uh, like, you know, my surroundings to actually be physical with women and rolling around and throwing them down on the ground and stuff. It was, it was the most surreal thing ever because it I just took me out of my comfort zone. I can't even imagine that. I, and I'll tell you why, because like similarly, you know, like I race in individual sports, right? You know, whether yeah. it be mountain biking or whatever, but I did a, it was kind of a silly race. I did one time where we had to like run through water pits and all this kind of stuff. And as I was running through a water pit, like the woman I was neck and neck with, she like stopped and threw her bike up to the side and she got into this wrestling stance. And I just no. was like, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't I'm, know what I'm you're doing. <laughs> but I am now like terrified because I have never, I cannot, I don't grapple. I don't know what we're doing. No, <laughs> no, 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 exactly, exactly. And then, and then, and then you've got this whole thing, like, you know, you know, you know, like you said, because you're into your own sports and you know your own physicality, you know how strong you are, you know what you can do because of the things that you're used to doing. I then had to rely on, you know, hitting people, rolling around on the floor and, you know, jumping up and after being, you know, hit and my head spinning all over the place, then regaining my, you know, my whereabouts. And this was at the age of, I think, what it was, 96, so probably the age of, uh, 
going on to like 31, 31, 32. Yeah, it was just like bizarre. But it was probably the best thing I ever did in my life in terms of a crossover because it got me a greater understanding of, because what happens in, in, in when you're a sports person you spend all your, all your time doing track and field. The, when it comes to an end, it's very difficult to know what to do because you're so used to traveling. You're so used to going from spot to spot, place to place. And even though I had a full-time job, I still was able to go around and do my thing. And then all of a sudden it was just going to be like quiet and you were going to be just a normal individual. And that the bit was going to be the bit that's the hardest bit, that little crossover. So that came at a perfect timing for me. Yeah, I can totally see that because that 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 depression is real. Like people, it's very hard when you go from like this very exciting traveling and you know all over the world competing, and then it's just crickets. Like that, a lot of yeah. people have a lot of a yeah. lot of trouble yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, one question: Did the hamstring resolve then? Like, were you okay? no? See, the things with my hamstring because it was it, it was doing my lower back, but because I wasn't sprinting. And I wasn't running flat out. I was able to contain the hamstring. Like it wasn't a problem because yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't taking it to its maximum. So, so the thing is that, you know, I still had the love of track in my mind because I still did the indoor arena. And like we have an indoor season and I ran a couple of races there. And it's really funny because um, when I did the gladiators, you'd be like, come on, come on. And then you'd be like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I tried to do it in a race, like, come on. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like it's, it's too different to, you know, scenarios, you can't do it. But, uh, but um, yeah, you know, when I actually left, I kind of, it was kind of a, a bittersweet moment because I knew I had to go because, you know, the levels that I wanted to get to, I knew I couldn't get to. And it was also, you know, I had to earn money because I didn't, I didn't make any money in track and field. I didn't right. make any money at all because I wasn't good enough to make it. Even though I got the bronze medal and I got to the Olympic Games, I wasn't on the purse circuit to go. So, so I had to, yeah, exactly. Only a few can make money out of track and field, right? So, so then I had to make a conscious decision about where I was going and what I wanted to do. So, yeah. So that's when I became a gladiator. So I, I read that you excelled particularly at Powerball, Pendulum, and The Wall. What are those events and gladiator? <laughs> So, so a power board is a bit like rugby. So you've got like these little pods, there's three pods and then you have to, the, cassette, the actual contestant has to put the ball into the pod and you have to stop them from getting there. So before we used to have three gladiators. So one in the middle, one on each side and two contestants. So it'd be easier. So the gladiator wouldn't do so much work because everything would be protected. But then when they took the middle gladiator out and it became one-on-one, -on -one, that was really difficult. And then you have to literally get them, turn them around and drop them on the floor and really win them. So they spend the whole time running away from you. So that was, um, you know, a power ball. Pendulum was the big ball in the air and it swings from side to side. And one's on one side, one person's on the other side and you have to run around and get the tag off the contestant. The contestant's got to hide from you. So I love that because it was dun, 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 dun. Da, da, da. I loved it. I actually loved it. And then, um, and then with the wall, it was just navigate yourself up a system. Like they'll, you know, they'll have a two second start. And then that's when I think that my um, athletic and my sprinting ability came into power then because it's the hand-eye coordination, using yourself to go up on the wall really quickly. So most of my games that I was very good at were the agile games We, you know, where I can, move around because that was the thing I was um I was good at um um jewel we know when you stand on the put with and you have to hit them with oh my god that thing used to literally I don't know I was so petrified when I went up there because you go up there and you put on a stance and you'd be really strong and you'd be hitting that person and you would think that you're not moving but when you look back on the camera it looks like a hurricane was around me because you're like this. <laughs> and it's just, it's just the most mind blowing moment because it's just the two of you, eye contact. And you have to steer the individual out to make sure that they get scared of you. And then once they blink, you know, you've got them. So I'm a real chatty. I love to talk to people and all that sort of thing. But when I was doing the gladiators, I was so poker face 
didn't hardly talk to any of the contestants because you had to have that little edge above them of fear. So you learned all these things whilst you was doing the gladiators, yeah. Did you give yourself the name Rebel or was that a sign? No, yeah, they gave me, it, I could have been Rebel or Rio. Hmm. And Rio was know. really, yeah, Rio, Rio was really girly. It was all of this like, flick your hair and <laughs> like, and, and that was me. And you know, I had this real, um, I, I had a real kind of like, uh, sort of like a, a situation where I was really fighting with myself about the, you know, the showbiz girl or the gladiator girl, because the gladiator girl had to have boobs, had to flick your hair, but you still had to be strong. And that just wasn't me. I wasn't like a massive makeup person and, you know, had my hair in braids, even though it's in locks now, but I just liked the sporting element. And I remember Kenny used to say to me, come on, Rebel, you've got to be a little bit more feminine. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And because I didn't do it, I hardly got on any of the commercial stuff. So then one day I decided, okay, I'm going to put on a weave and I'm going to put red lipstick on and I'm going to put this blue mascara and like the blue eyeshadow. And I... I, I saw myself on camera and I looked like a clown. And I remember Oprah Winfrey saying, black girls, you don't be wearing red lipstick or blue eyeshadow because it's not <laughs> you. <laughs> and I literally did it because I wanted to be noticed. And what it did, it took away everything that I was about. And I just thought, you know what? This isn't me. I'm not a makeup girl. I'm not a booby girl. I'm just Jennifer who just does her thing. And surprisingly, it took three years before he actually put me on, on a proper front of the, you know, the gladiator grill. And it wasn't until I literally had to show what I was about and that I stayed fit. I stayed in shape. I stayed all of this stuff. And then eventually they saw who I was as a person, but it's always this constant thing about having to stay being yourself to be noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Especially that time right I think that yeah yeah especially that time when I put my before I cut off yeah but um yeah it's that time in the sort of like late eight you know 90s and you know it, it was all about glamour and you know yeah. big boobs and loads of makeup and being really girly and getting people to treat you and talk to you the way you want to be and all that sort of stuff and it was it, it was a time where you had to stand strong with yourself and you, and you know, sometimes you would get swallowed up in society. I mean, that's because, you know, we, we don't have the power that we've got now. It, was, it wasn't even thought about then. A hundred percent. I mean, there was no social media. You couldn't build your own platform. Other people no. held all the keys to the castle. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, if Gladiators was around now with social media, OMG, I would be huge. I would have yeah. been large completely because it, yeah. it was yeah. such a big arena when we had it, we were blacked out um, coaches and loads of fans and yeah, but it was fantastic when it was. Yeah. And you also did stunt work, right? Like I didn't yeah. know that you were in Russell Crowe's Gladiator <laughs> until I did yeah, some work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is that they were looking for three gladiators, three black girls, we got the job. Um, I wanted to, to do stunt work. I thought, great, it'd be a great crossover to be a stunt girl and do some work and that sort of stuff. And um, when we got the audition, and uh, we were one, and you know, and they and they took us. It was amazing. It was twelve weeks in Malta, learning to do bow and arrow. Uh, but it was, you know, maybe a five minute slot. But it was a lot of hard work for that. And I thought, yeah, gonna be a stunt lady. This is brilliant. This loads, you know, this is really good money. And then I got pregnant. So <laughs> that put an end to that. <laughs> but I, I and I also read that that changed your life in a more positive way than you thought it was going to. Yeah, yeah, because again, you know, and it's really bizarre because when I, um, when you read um, all these books that are coming out and, you know, like Michelle Obama about becoming, all these things that you have when you have this preconceived idea of what you think you should be in life and you, you kind of think you're gonna to work towards it, but you change, you change with your age, you change with your environment, you change with the things that you used to like or don't like and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's when you allow yourself to go with that flow and you don't feel alarmed and scared and you just grow because you know that that's, that's just the natural growth of life. I think with that, and, you know, with the films um, and doing with the, you know, the Russell Crowe show, it really got me thinking about 
how quickly your life can revolve and just about you know not to be afraid to expect the unexpected basically I love that um and you ended up having two daughters two daughters yeah I had two daughters yeah and then um and then the part my partner well their dad we were together for 19 years and then we split Mm. when the girls were quite young I think um Alicia was four maybe going on five and Renee was um two years old yes yeah two years old and um but um bizarrely enough we still run our business together this is a whole new four game yeah no yeah yeah but you know the thing the thing that I found and you you know I talk to my girls about this because they're 21 and 17 is you know I love my girls and their DNA is their dads and they were supposed to be born as far as I'm concerned like they're amazing but I knew that their dad was not for me within two years of our relationship but I stayed and sucked that rock for 19 years can you hear what I said 19 years thinking thinking if only I showed him how amazing I am and how much I care about him he's going to change he did not and he still has not okay like I've known John like since I was 23 years old I'm 58 soon and he you know he's remarried and Claudia his wife is fantastic I get on with her so well but he still will always see me exactly the same way and yeah. I laugh at it now because his wife looks at me she's like I don't I, I don't get like how did the two of you get on you're so different I'm like I don't know either like but isn't it amazing and I say to my girls that when you meet someone in life and you know that it's not right nine out of ten is right ten you're completely right. And this whole thing about if you stay with them and they get to know who you are and you work on it, eventually they'll see you. No, because he stayed being who he was true to be, but I was the one who changed. And I did all the stuff I thought was the right thing to do to hang on. 19 years now, like it's still the same thing. If you said to to John, oh, today is Monday and the sun is shining. He'd be like, oh, great. If I said exactly the same sentence, all he would hear would be, ah! <laughs> <laughs> because that's just how he is, you know? So, because we, we are different animals and it's really bizarre. Like, as you get older, you realize these things. You think, wow, like, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Really interesting that we actually thought back in that time, that you can change somebody's personality or the persona. And I'm not saying that he was wrong or whatever, but he was just being who he was. Yeah, and you also get into a rhythm of taking care of things, right? You're taking care yeah. of your girls, you're taking care of the household, you're taking care of the, you know, you like, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you get to a certain point where you're like, I think I need to take care of myself, you know, like. Think, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, completely. And the thing is, is that especially like I think now, I think when people talk about when you become 50, that it's like, oh, my God, you're going through this uh, this midlife crisis and all this sort of stuff. It's just not that. It's just not. It is. OK, you have to get there to understand it, obviously. But it is so just not that. What it is, is you have a better clarity and understanding of life because you have years and years and years of experience and years and years of individual and people, personalities and everything. And then you get to a stage where you think, hmm, quality. That's what I want. I want quality. So I'm going to sit through my life and I'm going to think, hmm, do you add any value to my life? No, you don't. Bye. Do you add any value to my life? No, you don't. Bye. And the thing is, I'm not ever going to knock my my journey because my journey is my journey. And my girls, oh, my God, they are my life. And if their DNA is their dad, then their DNA is their dad. If that's an experience I had to get because I had to have these two girls, I'm taking that, that experience. But what I know now in terms of me as a person and what I've learned on that journey who I am today, 
hey, love it. Love it. I love that. I That is very, very, very well put. Um, I, I'm curious where, because we do talk about menopause on the show, obviously, like where menopause yeah. uh, intersects with this. I've seen you, you know, in some different articles talking pretty openly about it and also that it did definitely impact your physicality. You know, you are a very active person and it sounds like it had some sort of a profound effect on you. I'd love you. Yeah. To yeah. Cause I think, that. because when I, I mean, cause I, I won a competition ages ago and it was like a modeling competition. Like, and so I've never been, I've never been like conscious of my body or stuff. I've always just worked hard. And then when I started doing modeling and, and I thought this is something different, you know, I, I went gray. I decided to change all about, you know, my outlook about me and what I wanted. And then, um, you know, I think the menopause probably hit me quite late. Maybe I might have been, you know, Perry more um, menopause beforehand, but I, um, but I found that, um, that when I saw about 52 and uh, the hot sweat started and I could feel like the waist became square and, you know, the excess access around my stomach wasn't, wasn't going as quickly in the back fat. And like, I was like, you know, just feeling like slightly lethargic. And then um, I had a conversation with um, a, a lady, Davina McCall, she's done loads of books and uh, we were talking about HRT and going on to it and that sort of stuff. So I went on a HRT and, um, and you know, and initially I thought it was amazing. Like it was so good for me, but then I, I, I think that when you're, an, when you're a sports person, you kind of like really in tune in your body and you know when something's just not right. And I felt that, um, that something wasn't, feeling quite you know right with me so I went and had a smear test I had the sm um, small polyps on your on my uterus and um they said it might have been you know, too much estrogen or whatever it may be blah 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 so then I decided to come off HRT and I could have done the natural hormones all that sort of stuff and then I decided that I'm going to really concentrate on like my ability like my food my training my well-being in my mind how how I was looking at myself going through the menopausal stage, um, you know, with the weight gain, you know, how um, is this meant to change my life? You know, am I going to be what everybody expects me to be or am I going to be what I expect myself to be? And so I did that whole thing with just looking at my guts and understanding how my gut was functioning and digesting food and the type of foods I was taking in. And so far, it's been so good. What did you, what did you change? So what I changed was um, my, I got a probiotic, right? Cause I think like the probiotics for me, I think the one thing I found was that I was thinking, okay, if this is true and everyone's saying that, you know, you know, our, you know, our midriff is, is going to get big, whether we like it or not, because of the menopause, we put on weight. That's what we're going to do. I was thinking, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, why is it just there and nowhere else? Like, why is it just sitting there? And I just thought maybe that it's just not churning over the way it should do. Like my gut is like my engine. It's, you know, it's the thing that, you know, spits things in, you know, out and, you know, it takes things in and does whatever it's supposed to do. And I was just doing so much research and understanding that as you get older, everything slows down. It's just, you just it's just what it is. And there's certain foods you can eat, there's certain foods you can't eat. So once I've got an understanding of that, and I changed the, the, the hours that I eat. So, you know, it, it, you can call it, you know, intermittent fasting or however you want to call it, but I'm governed by how my gut feels. If I feel like I've eaten too much and it hasn't like digested it properly, I'm not gaining, I'm not, I'm not having anything that's going to layer on top. I'm going to wait till it becomes content. When it becomes content, I'll eat again. When it don't feel content, I won't eat again. And the difference in my body shape is incredible. I train less now since I've worked out how my gut works than I than I've um, ever done before. And I see that you are in the weight room quite a bit. Like I see, yeah. I see your yeah. Instagram. It looks that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, because you know, for me, I think you know, I'm never going to say to people or women of any age or any shape or size or whatever that this is how you've got to be, this is how you've got to look or anything like that, because people are happy with ever with however they want to be. And it's, down, you know, it's totally down to them. For me, working out and going in a gym, that's my medicine. 
you know, somebody, you know, binging on TV or, you know, going out for a walk or whatever, that's their medicine. But being in the gym for me is my medicine. And also for, for you know, for women, it's, it's really good for us just to zone into ourselves because it's, it's so bizarre because I had a conversation with some friends about, yeah, but Jennifer, it's so easy for you because you love the gym, you love this, you love that. And I'm like, you guys don't have to go crazy. Just have to do a little bit at a time for yourself what makes you feel good but I think that what happens um to women and it's so it's so easy done because we we get disconnected from ourselves sometimes is that you go through this stage is when you're a teenager you don't have to look after your body because it looks after itself right you can just rock up at the gym you can do two sit-ups and it looks like you've done 50 right <laughs> all right so 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 you don't really have to invest in invest invest in yourself because it will just do it yourself then you go for the nurturing side, the family, the kids, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to a stage where it's, you now have to properly start investing in yourself. Then the question comes then is how much do you really want to invest in yourself? Are you just articulating it or do you really feel it in here that you want to you know, start investing in yourself and investing in yourself in a way where nobody can take you away from it because that's, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% because your 10% could be 100%, right? It doesn't have to be, I've got to be in the gym seven days a week or eat the right food seven days a week or whatever. You could just have your one day of greatness and just look after yourself. Yeah, it's, it sounds like what I'm hearing from you is a very intuitive journey. I mean, from that, from that eating of sort of just like tuning in and listening and going with what you're feeling to like what you're doing in the gym. And it's interesting that there's also like some pretty good research to back all that up. You know, like your gut health yeah. is very important for your hormonal health. They're finding like yeah. your gut microbiome is kind of everything. It's very important. So yeah, yeah. it makes a, a lot of sense. Um, I, I am, I, I'd love to hear a bit more about the decision to go gray because it's, it's fascinating that even the most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like even, you know, the, the women who are just like Confident embracing, women, yeah. yes, embracing all of it. Uh, maybe listen, not so much. Gray, <laughs> yeah. Listen, the gray journey was the hardest decision. I think I've like emotionally, emotionally, cause it wasn't, it wasn't an, uh, something that was outwardly, um, exposing itself it was the inward emotion that was exposing itself to me as a person and the reason why I say this is because like okay black women when we go to bed at night we tie our head down with a head scarf go to bed you wake up you know you're washing your face you wake up you're feeling great nothing's mad you take the head scarf off and the greys come and you're like oh my god and just naturally inside you you just sink and the grey just tells you aging it tells you that, you know, you're, you know, that you're growing older and that sort of stuff. And like, you know, for me, I was allergic to hair dye after mm. I had the girls. I mean, I dyed my hair in every single color you could think of when I was younger. And after my first girl, I, I had a reaction to the hair dye. My face blew up and, you know, the, you know, you know, all the fluid, it was just awful. The second time it happened, I just said, that's it. Like, you can't, you can't dye your hair, Jennifer. And I tried to go for all those hennas, put my head on the wall leave a black mark on the wall <laughs> and I was like this isn't going to work for me so when I decided to go gray it was a really interesting journey because a lot of my friends thought I was going through a depression they were like you know you okay you know you look like someone who doesn't want to take care of themselves. are you sure you want to do this like you know we can go and do some research and find you know the right hair dyes for you and everything and I was like no and it was really tough because I was I became that person that I used to look at other people to mm -hmm. when I used to look at them and think like I'll be talking to somebody and the first thing they do be looking at my hair and they're like what why how come you haven't done your roots like why and I could see them looking at me and then I thought oh my gosh like I, I end up giving myself a story every time oh the reason why I'm doing this is because my hair's died blah 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 and then my teenage daughter said mommy you need to stop like you don't need to give an, an, an excuse like you have to start owning what you're doing, like make it fashionable, make it your statement, make it your thing. And then as soon as I started to embrace it 
and realizing that this is going to be a part of me now and I'm going to have to change the way I think, you know, how I look at it. As soon as I started doing that, everybody's perception changed. It was, it was crazy. It was like, oh my God, your hair looks so great, gray. I don't know. I don't think I could ever, I, you know, imagine you without gray hair and all of this sort of thing. And, you know, the initial outcome was, oh my God, I feel really old. And then it just jubilates you. It makes you start looking like, you know, more fresh and, and younger and, you know, more confident and that sort of stuff. And the more people I see now with gray hair, it's, it is this thing of confidence, but it has to come from, um, from within. And I do get it if women are not ready because it's not just about an external thing. This is really internal. Yes. Uh, and it's so interesting that you say that because I, when I, when I look at women like yourself and others who have sort of like really like truly embraced this, this gray hair, they do have a youthfulness about them that is yeah. emergent, right? It's not yeah. like, it's not like, oh, we need to look young or this anti-aging thing. It's that, no. just this vibrancy that is 100%. what you associate yeah. with. Yeah. 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 But that, but I mean, to me, that has to come from within. Totally. It's not something that you can just get out and just do it because you will, because, because you will be literally hiding yourself because you will be in and out and you won't be confident. I think that when you've done it and it's something that you want to do, and you and you feel amazing while you're doing it it will show itself up and I would never say to somebody oh you've got to go gray like come on come on because I understood how I went through it and it was I, I you know I would never call myself a conscious person but I was so conscious when I went gray and and, and, and particularly when I was single and uh, before I met Ian, I was thinking oh my god how am I going to meet someone the first thing they're going to see is that I'm gray but uh, no, it was fine. That's wow. That's that. That is that is a very cool story. And and it's yeah. And it also didn't hurt your modeling. I mean, you're no, uh, right. Do you know that's the thing? That's the thing that really that I found really crazy was the fact is that because of going gray and having the locks and having something different and and you know embracing the you know to be like to be older. Um, and I started doing modeling. I weren't sure whether I was going to get into modeling, but, and I did. And I, you know, and I've loved it. The one, the only one thing that I find really bizarre about modeling is that modeling for my age, uh, you know, 58 or 60, whatever, 60 or 58 soon, I'm going to be 60 in two years time. I'm like, ah, but is that the clothes sometimes they put me in. It's like, come on, like I need something edgy. Hmm. Like, you know, we, you can't you can't put us in the what we wore like in the seventies and eighties. Like the women who are in their fifties and sixties now, they want to be trendy. Right. They want to be right. hip. They don't care whatever side you you just make us trendy. So when you put in us in like square, glittery, fluffy, big shirts, it's like no. And that's the thing I think that needs to be changed slightly a little bit in terms of women's fashion in our age group because it's different it's so different you know i'm not talking about walk, walking around in short skirts and whatever it's it's classy really classy do you have say in that no no mm. when you when you turn up to, to model you have to model whatever they tell you to put on right fair enough and you could be a farmer's wife to a to a, a i don't know a, a fairy on a tree do you know what I mean? Like you just can't do anything about what they put you in. This what they put you in, and it's and it's a shame sometimes because I look and I think the only reason why I'm in this is because of my age, and it does age you. It yeah. does age you because the difference of when I put my own clothes on to the clothes I'm wearing, I'm like that's just light years away. And do you find yourself um, projecting? differently or having to make yourself project more because you are not comfortable like there's a disconnect between what you're yeah, wearing yeah I had to it, it was a skill that was taught to me by my modern agency like you've got a rocket like right. it doesn't matter if you've got the the squarest pair of shoes on or whatever it may be just just wear it just wear it and just make it your own signature and yeah. so at first it was like really like oh like just give me something different but then I just thought no you know this is what it is it's like it's the client they want you to wear this it's it's probably for the I don't know when they say the majority of women I'm like no because we're not like that right, right. but they'll but, still put it out there 
they they will still put it out there and we're like no it's not us yeah i mean i think that that i think that's slowly starting to change the more you have very high profile women who are 50 plus you know with with these platforms saying this is not us you know I, yeah, and getting yeah. positions of power where they can actually yeah. pull those strings i think yeah. that's where the change comes from yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's not other people's Although, ideas yeah. of what you're supposed yeah. to look like yeah yeah and and you know just like everything else revolves in terms of you know you know electronics so does life so does women so do you know so so the fact that we're actually in charge of who we are which is which is so exciting it's so exciting in terms of like we, you know, we're not trying to be like over, you know, like feminist individuals, but what we're doing is just turning our world inside into us yeah, and understanding what it is. And like, for me, it's almost when your kids are grown up or, you know, you know, everything else is, is kind of like um, stepping away from you. It's almost like you have to sit there and just say, you know, allow yourself to have that step one moment where you feel a little bit kind of like jaded and you feel like things are not going to work well. But don't take that as a negative. Take it as your your research ground, because when you're in that sort of like negative step back, that's the only time you start searching and you start looking around for things and you start wondering this and wondering that. And that should be our state of power. It shouldn't be a part where it tells us that we're weak. It should be where we're thinking, okay, I'm going to grab all this information because I'm looking and I'm trying to figure this out, I'm trying to figure that out. And then when you get it, you'll settle back down again. And then you just start making your steps. Right. So I, I had heard you to, to sort of pivot a bit. I had heard you on um, Black Women and Beyond, I think was yeah. the podcast. Yeah. yeah. In, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. And I would love your insights there because, you know, she talks about being fed up with not being included in the larger conversation and there's a huge conversation going on right now yeah yeah yeah, of course of course yeah and you hear you know i went to the north american menopause society annual meeting and there were uh, several sessions like black women have a longer time a harder time like there's all these disparities of course in health and society but what would if you had a magic wand you know if i gave you one right now like (laughs) What you know? What would what would you do in this space for Black women? Yeah, I mean, for me, I just feel that we should be, and I don't know if it's a fact, but because of the way that the world has been on, like you know, for Black people in general, is that we just tough it up, we just get on with it, put our heads down, because that's all we know. We know just to just muscle our way through life, and just if someone doesn't come our way, we just keep on going. And I just think that what it, what needs to be opened up in terms of like for black women in their menopause is the fact is understanding, you know, you know, the cultural food, the way that we are, you know, the, you know, the body composition and that sort of stuff. Like, you know, the, the fact is that because we don't speak out, it doesn't mean to say we're not going through it because right. we're not coming together as like, a, you know, I think that maybe a lot of black women, you know, and I will say myself included, that we should stand tall, we should stand up in front and we should be able to say like, look, this is not working for us. Like, this is how we feel. We're having a bad time. We're going through these sweats, whatever. But because of the way that we have been conditioned, it's almost like, you know, we've got to soldier on. Mm. We've got to push through it. If I speak to my mother about going for the menopause, she's like, ah, it was nothing. Just went through it, had to go through it. It's just life. That's what we had to do. And you know, we've got this cultural thing where is that supposing we did go up and say something and then society just pushes to one side, then that's just doing what it normally does. So instead of putting ourselves in front of it and getting slapped down, we're like, okay, you know what? We're just going to just soldier through. So the difference in terms of the people that are coming forward are more white than black because we don't want to have to go through that same stage of being like told, yeah, well, it's probably not as bad as you think it is. You'd be fine, that sort of stuff, blah, blah, blah. We were like, instead of going there, let's, our parents are done for it. They've gone for it. Let's us all go for it. And we need to be able to say, we don't have to do it anymore. Like, we can put our hands up and say, enough's enough. Like, I'm, I'm tired. Something's not right. Something doesn't seem right. I don't know what it is. Like, look at me, basically. And I think it's okay for us to do that. And I think that's what, we have to do as 
you know, a black nation is like to stand forward. But then equally so, we've got to make sure that we get received just as quickly and as excited as everybody else. Yeah, and that, that takes larger cultural change. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it does, and it, you know, because it's really bizarre because I, I was having this conversation with my girls and, uh, you know, they've never really had um, anything adverse happen to them for being black, you know, mm-hmm. but they will look at something and they'll be like, wow, like, you know, we're talented with this, we're that. And like, we have to like push through all these little barriers. And because with that, because that's something that we've always done, it's almost become a habit in life. Like, it's like, ah, uh, you know, let's just go through it. Like, okay, they can say that, but we're still gonna go through it. But we literally have to change the narrative. We have to change the narrative and make everything as equal as we can. And like you said, it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time, but, but for black women, we have to stand forward and we have to make ourselves be seen and to be amongst and to group with others that are going through exactly the same thing. Yeah, and, and to, um... I mean, I, I've seen a lot of communities online emerging, like the podcast you were on, and there's yeah, yeah. many yeah. different menopause Instagrams that are now like Black women going through menopause, which is really, really great to see. And just, I, th- I think like we were talking before offline, like having that community, their strength, right, in those numbers and yeah. being seen is very important. And then this larger medical community, which has a really bad history of... um dismissing black women you know need, needs yeah. to yeah I, I don't get that yeah. see the things that me I you know like I said that's a I mean that's a society thing right it's not you know it's it is either a yes or a no it's like who is the more important and and that's how it is and that's how it that's how the narrative has got to be changed because the thing is is like I said it's like it's almost like um you know it was, it's a bit of a kind of like belittering like you know a black woman like, yeah. like, you know, that we don't figure. And, and, and we do, because just as well as anyone else is bringing, a, uh, you, know, you know, an individual into the world, like, you know, we do it as well. And like, when I think about women as well, I'm like, women get a hard deal, right? But we give life, right? Right? Everybody that's being brought into this world is for a woman, right? That, you, you, you can't get past that. Secondly, Everybody in this world has been guided, breastfed, nurtured into this world by a woman, right? And you say 80% of it, 20% men, whatever, you, however you want to put the figures. Then you look at it and you think, why are women so second class? Like without us, then we, we won't be buzzing. There's nowhere to buzz. If we shut our legs and <laughs> gave no birth, there will be nothing going on, right? So it's almost like we need to like get it together and say like the world is the world because we give life to the world and we nurture these kids, these human beings to become great in this world. So the person that's nurturing it, like we need to be looked after, but equally so women need to look after each other and we need to engage in black, white, whatever, you know, um, you know, culture you may be, we need to help each other. And we need to bring each other on and to say, look, you know, black person or white person or whoever it may be, you know, come to it like one of our classes, one of our menopause classes or whatever. Mix amongst us. Let's get some answers. Let's know what's going on. Let's work together as a unit to get this medical side and people understanding just to rock on. You know, if I, you know, and I can say this because I'm at the age that I'm at, if all the people that are in, the top jobs who are old, they need to just like whoosh, go and let the younger ones who have got a little bit more savvy, a little bit more understanding in life, let them take over because they understand. Like there's going to be, they don't see color, color. They just see everyone united and moving on. I'm just going to let that mic drop sit right there. I- <laughs> <laughs> Get out of the way, old people. <laughs> I can say that. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> so the, I think this segue is great to my to to what I think is my last question. Um, 
you know, I read this really wonderful passage and I can't remember which, what article it was in where you said you wanted to get rid of the word selfish, that you thought that it should be abolished. Yeah. Um, and because you could have pushed your boundaries a bit further. And I, I would love you to talk about that in context of what you meant then and what it might mean now. Yeah, because you know, the thing about selfish and the thing that I've learned as I've gone throughout, you know, my life, and this is the fact is like, this is not, you know, I wasn't somebody that was given a silver spoon. I've had to work hard, you know, you know, coming from a single parent and, you know, not having much and, you know, working, working hard. Every time that you want to put yourself forward and you want to look after you, everyone's like, you can't be that. You can't do that. That's just being selfish. You can't look after yourself. You're like, how, why can't I look after me? Because the same way somebody who's important looking after themselves, why can't I look after me? Why does me looking after me sound selfish? If I am being nice to everybody and I'm saying, hi, how are you? You're great, you're fantastic. But in my prowess, the what I think about is me first. And me first, not in a sense of me first, I'm going to push you out the way and I don't care if you get hurt. This is me first loving me. This is about... You know, when I look at teenagers, they don't care about the world. They just care about themselves. As long as they look good. I remember looking at my eldest daughter and she was sitting in the corner smiling. I was like, what are you smiling at? She's looking at selfies of herself, right? <laughs> and it made me laugh because I thought, this is a girl that loves what she is about. She loves how much she's working. Her work ethic is incredible. She looks back at herself and makes statements to herself like, damn, I look good. Damn, I'm doing this right. Who am I or anybody to turn around and say to her, you're just being selfish or you're thinking about yourself? Because she is going to be the best version of herself to meet whoever she has to meet out in the world and to be amongst other individuals, but a confident person. So to tell somebody who is literally giving themselves back that self-love to say that is selfish, that I find incredible incredible because in order for you to be the best version of yourself you have to look after you right you have to be able to get up in the morning if you're not feeling great about yourself and you're like i gotta look after everybody else and you're not feel, it's going to show and no one's going to want to be around you but if you're walking with a step and you're smiling and you're feeling confident and you're shaking your hair and you're, you're, you're standing tall people are going to look at you and they're going to be like what is she doing this person is rocking it. What is she doing? And, and that no me, expiration date on that, right? None, none whatsoever. Because all it is is about, you know, and I say this to my girls, like if you're around somebody and that person is only about themselves and they're saying you have to be or listen to what they are telling them you that you have to be in life, you have to say to yourself, who is more important here? If they're saying to you, no, you've got to be this way because I'm this way, then they're obviously looking at what's important to them. So if they are equally looking at what's important to them, why can't you look at what is important for you? Because that's just how life is, right? And it, to me, it's, I don't know. I just feel like, just be the best version of yourself. Like, like love who you are, love the, you know, the idea of growing you know, embrace things like, like I said, like, you know, and I'll say it really quickly in terms of like your age, you know, you know, your body, your skin type ain't going to be exactly the same, which is fine. It's not a problem. You're going to have hair growing on your face. I got a, like a, like a white eyelash just coming up here, <laughs> right? You got parts of your body that you think like, where the hell did that skin come from? Like, I'm going to have to start doing some like, you know, pelvic floor exercises or something like that. But know that you can make it slightly better for you where you can enjoy and embrace it and when people see that positivity around you they don't see anything else but they just see positivity and that's what the world's all about it's just you being positive and smiling your way through and bouncing from place to place because that's all we can do i love she that says. i love that is there anything um that we haven't talked about that you think that this audience could benefit from i mean i think that you've that has all been amazing, but no, I think, do you know, when I think about the whole aging and I, and I think about, oh my God, Jennifer, you're going to be 60 years old in two years time. You know, that's a big old adult's name, but, but I kind of like, 
it's, it's, it's intriguing. I find this whole aging thing intriguing. And I find it intriguing because every year is a different year. Every year is a different goal. Every year is about refining, um, polishing. Like, you know, you got to, you know, you get up in the morning, like, you, you, know, you, know, the set, like, you know, when you're young, you can polish and just a little bit, the shine will come straight away. And as you get older, you've got to scrub in that thing to make that shine come through. But like I said, it's all about investment. It's all about understanding that, okay, you know, the only way I can become relevant is relevant for myself. And if I treat myself 100%, then people outside can only see what I see. And that's 100%. And that's how I see it. Well, that's our show. Come on back next week when I sit down with Kristen Domenico, the author of Dying to Be Enough, who shares an all too common journey through the relentless pursuit of perfection, eating disorders, addiction, and how it can all come to a head during perimenopause. You won't want to miss it. So come on back for that one. And until then, as always, stay feisty. <laughs>been listening to hit play not pause a feisty menopause podcast for active performance minded women i'm your host celine yeager the show is edited and produced by the strong talented and amazing women at live feisty media follow us on social media at feisty menopause and please help us spread the word screenshot and share this episode on your social media channels with the tag at feisty menopause share the show with your friends And please subscribe, like, review, and rate this show wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth and good reviews make it easier for other listeners to find. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay feisty.